So this session will try to teach you a little bit more about how Pester works internally. On the agenda, we have scoping, scoping, and scoping. So I will talk a lot about how scoping works and what, uh, what hoops Pester needs to jump through to make the testing work and seem seamless. And then I will show a few new features in Pester v5 and how they work and how they are implemented. So I will talk about test discovery, test execution, the new result object that is like a trunk in the middle of the new runtime, and then some internal plugins that hopefully in the future will be also available publicly. So this is version two of the talk, the version one I gave here last year. The version two focuses on scoping and various bits in version five. The previous one focuses more on version four and gives more <laughs> comprehensive overview of the whole framework. So I uh, encourage you to look it up if you want to get more comprehensive overview. There are also more talks about Pester that you might be interested in. So tomorrow I will be talking about custom Pester assertions. And also during the lunch there will be a like, community engagement discussion about Pester version 5 because there is some stuff that I want to discuss with the community. And I try to outline it in Pester issues so you don't have to remember this number. If you just go to the Pester repo to issues, it should be the first one. So I encourage you to read it so we can have a better discussion because we only have 35 minutes there and uh, I don't want to spend it the whole time showing the new features without getting any feedback. So on the slides, the code might not work. I'm only trying to show simplified code with the relevant pieces. It's contents, PowerShell, shorter namespaces, and so on. The demos hopefully should work, but if not, then just blame Yap. So scoping. In scoping, scoping is the hardest part of Pester to understand, at least to me, because it's the hardest one to see. It's just transparent. You cannot really see what's happening because it's all just script blocks and ampersands and dots. And so unless you develop Pester, there is little chance that you already have uh, some experience with this, unless you uh, do your own DSLs, and you probably never had to take uh, deal with it too much. You are on one side lucky, but on the other hand, you have a chance to learn something new today. So the overview for this part is that I will try to establish the baseline by repeating the basics that you probably already know, then go to more advanced topics and then show you how we use them in Pester. So when we're talking about scope, we have to talk about two things. One of them is scope. Scope maintains the lifetime of your variables and functions and other stuff, but for me, only functions and variables are important. Some of the constructs in PowerShell define new scope and some of them don't. And then when scope ends, then the variables and functions defined in it will die with it. So that's something that you already know, I think. And there is also dynamic scoping which means that the values that you define in upper scopes will fall through and they will be available in the child scopes. That's also something that you know, but I will show you demos, of course. And then we have a session state, and session state is like a big bag that contains those scopes and all of the things that are associated with a single module. And if you are in a script, then you also have a session state. It, doesn't, it just isn't linked to a module. It could be thought about like linked to anonymous module. So if we put it in a picture, then the big rectangles, the colorful ones, are the session states. And then inside of them, there are scopes. So normally, the code runs in the scope 0. And if we introduce a new scope, then scope 0 will shift up, become a scope 1, and new scope 0 is created. Then when you define something inside of the scope and the scope ends, then scope 0 will be removed. The variables defined in it will be removed, and it will again shift downwards. It's uh, Difficult to describe, but you have experience with this already. So if we look at mo it, uh, a typical Pester test, and from the point of view of a session state, then I have this module M, which defines a script scope variable A, which has value module M. Then I have function that's called get internal, which is not published from the module, which just links to the script A variable. Then I have function get public, which just calls through to get internal, and that one is public. So if we call get public, we should get module M. But we want to test it somehow, and we want to replace this get internal function. So in the test here below, what we expect to happen is that when we call this mock, 
that we call through this get public, we will get hello and it will be the same as expected. So what needs to happen here is that because this is an internal function, then from module, from pester module, we need to reach into the module M and look at its internal state. And then we also need to define the mock there and make it stay in there. And then when we invoke the mock, we will go here inside of the module M, we will invoke the, the mock of the get internal function, and we need to somehow reach back into the internal state of pester because that's where the behavior is defined, behavior being this script block right here. And then when we invoke the behavior in step four, we need to make sure that this in, is executed inside of this session state because we need to resolve the value to expected hello. So it's quite a lot of jumping around and uh, it's not very easy, very easy to do with like standard PowerShell, but I will show you how we do it. I also have to warn you because I will most likely just say scope all the time instead of scope and session state because I just think about them the same way. So if I say one scope deeper in the parent scope, I mean the scope, the thing that manages the lifetime of variables. And if I say module scope, caller scope, script scope, or test scope, I mean the session state in that place, so the whole bag. If you want to see a great talk on scoping in depth, then refer to Bruce Payette's uh, talk from PS Confu 2017. Okay, so now many scoping demos. So, as I said, some constructs in PowerShell define new scopes. So we have this function, it has this curly braces, and if I run this piece of code, we can see that the value here is still the original value. Why is this not zoomed up? Let me just fix that real quick. 14. Can you read it in the back? Should I try to make it even bigger? Okay, good. So here in the demo, I'm defining this original value, then I'm trying to rewrite it in, inside of the function, and then I can see in the bottom that, um, come on, one more time. Okay, uh, that the value A was not overwritten because we created a new scope using the function F. Now, if we do the same thing with a different construct, like an if, then we also have those curly braces, but they don't form a new scope. So if we take this action, it will overwrite the value A with new value. That's something that you already know, something that you probably use every day. Now, if we take the same idea and we apply it to script block, so I can define this script block that does the same thing as in the function or in the if, and then I can invoke it with ampersand the invocation operator, and we get the same result. So the ampersand creates a new scope, and when I call the assignment to A inside of it, it won't overwrite the value of A, like with a function. And then if I do the same thing, but I use the dot instead, it will not run in a new scope, it will run in the same scope. And you already use this, you use this to import your files into your test scripts. So it's not very surprising, it will do the same thing as with if or try or for each, it just won't create a new scope and it will overwrite A. And this seems like a trivial thing, but it's useful to know when you want to invoke code that somebody gave you and uh, you want to either keep the variables or the functions in scope after it finishes or you don't. So that's what you use uh, to do it. And we also have this dynamic scoping, which you already also know. So I have this variable A and function E. And here inside of F and F, function F creates a new scope. I call those identifiers and you can see that I get the values back because the values fall from the parent scope to the child scope, even though I did not define them here in function F. And with ampersand operator, totally the same idea. New scope, the values fall down, and you have them available. So to get this point across, I wrote this small function that's called count scope, which just looks for the error variable, and error variable is good for this because it's automatic, it's constant, so you cannot redefine it and it's not defined as in all scopes. So it's always just here, 
and if you are here five scopes deep, then you just can check. Is it here? No. Is it here? No. Is it here? No. And you just add to counter until you find error, the error variable. So that's exactly what I'm doing here. I'm just looking for it in the scope, which comes from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and upwards, until I find error. And then I'm returning the value. Uh, I'm using one here because we already are in a function. So if we are in a function, then this is the scope that is before the function, and this is inside of the function. And so the error cannot, can never be here inside of the function because I didn't define it. So I'm just starting from here and going upwards. And for the same reason, I'm also removing one here because uh, I'm in a function, so there is one more scope than I would expect. So if I run this, I can use it to count how deep I am. So here in the root, I count the scope and it becomes zero. Let me just push it up a bit. Here I said I'm creating new scope, so that's what I see here as well. The scope is one. Here it's uh, dot sourced, so the scope is zero. And here we just have to count those because we know, know that ampersands are creating new scopes. So that will be three ampersands, three scopes. We get three right here. Now, you already also know that the session states are independent. So if I have this script A variable inside of a module and I have the script A variable inside of a script, then if I run this, I will get script and module because the variables resolve dependent on in which session state they are. So this one goes back to the module state, but this one is in the, in the script session state. So we get two different values. Now, where it gets interesting for Pester itself is that is when we try to invoke the script blocks inside of a module. So that's useful because that's what you do with Pester all the time. You have this describe function, and describe function is defined inside of module Pester, but you give it this script block to invoke, and it invokes it somehow, and you probably want this script block to be invoked here. So all the variables in here are resolved to this, and you don't see the internals of Pester. So what you would want is that if you give it this script block, it is invoked in the script session state, not in the Pester modules session state. So let's try that. I'm just going to define this. And here in my module, I'm defining three functions. So I have this add script block, which is just invoking the script block, uh, dot sourcing the script block, and then invoking it some three scopes deep, and then dot sourcing it. So what I do here is that I first show you how it works if you are just doing it locally in the script. And then I do it the same way inside of the module. And you can see the results are the same, and that's because the script block is bound to the session state which created it. So even though I'm transporting the script block and running it inside of a module, it will run in the, in the script session state. And this is awesome for us because then we don't have to do any more work. It just works by itself. So doing the same thing with dot sourcing. I'm dot sourcing in here, overwriting B. I'm just going to restore the state and running the same thing. And the result is again the same, so this works. So the last thing to uh, answer is how it works if we are deeper in the scopes. Will it dot source into this scope zero or not? So I can try that. And uh, it does the same thing again. And that's because how deep we are in the sessions in the scopes is uh, independent, is depending on the module. So I will rather show you a picture. So in the pester, or in the module that I outlined, we are some free scopes deep, and then I jump back into the first session state and dot source it there, but there we are still in scope zero, so I can define the variable in there uh, by dot sourcing the script block. And this is useful, for example, for defining functions, like for mocks, or defining variables outside of your module, something like dollar matches if you have regex and so on. Uh, how we are on the time? 15, okay, great. Now, there are different ways to grab the session state because, as I said, the session state is the back of all the variables and the functions. And you can do it by either using execution context dot session state, and that shows you the current session state you are in. And also, you can do this ps command let session state if you have commandlet binding. 
and that gives you the session state that is the session state of the caller, so the place that called this function. So if I define this module, and I look at the $SS, which is the session state coming from the script, you can see here in the module that there is none uh, associated with it, so I know I'm in the script. If I do the $SSM, which is coming from the module M, you can see that module M here is defined as M. With SSC, which is the session state of the caller, so I am the caller, I'm calling the function from uh, the script, you again get module that's not associated to anything, so that's the script session state. And if I use this SSP, oh God, SSP, and that's the session state of coming from module P, but inside of the module P, I'm calling the function. So I'm calling to the inside of module P, and from there I'm calling the function that gives me the session state of the caller. So what I should get is the session state of module P. And that's what I get. So let me just show you. So here I'm calling this function, and here from here, from the insides of module P, I'm calling the other function that's grabbing the caller session state. So it depends on where you call it from. That's why it's called a caller session state. And just having access to the session state, we can do some cool things with it. So I can, for example, peek inside of module M and look at the value of variable A. So I can see it's module M. And I can do the same thing with this trick where I'm grabbing the module object of module M and then I'm using ampersand, the instance of the object module and then the script block. So I'm again peeking inside of module M. Now this is where it starts to get interesting. So as I said, from inside of uh, Pester, we need to define a mock in a different module or we need to reach into it. And how we do this is by a trick that Dave White came up with and that's uh, that you have a session state, and session state has internal object that's called session state internal. And then you have a script block which also has internal object which is the same type. So if you take a session state and a script block and you move this internal session state to the other place, then you bound this script block to the other session state. So if you get uh, a hold of the caller session state and you create a new script block, then you can bind it to the caller session state and do different stuff there. So this way you can grab the session state of a module and invoke code inside of it and so on. So it enables us to jump in between any session state that we want. And uh, in the code it looks like this is a bit of reflection, but what it actually does is just this. You get a session state, internal property inside of it, you grab the internal session state, and you have a script lock which has session state internal, and you just assign it there and that way you bind it. And that enables for a lot of cool things. So you can jump in between session states as you want, execute code wherever you want. This is kind of a long demo. I encourage you to go on, look at the code, and look at it for yourself. Because there is another thing that I want to show you. So if you define a, a mock, then you want to execute it inside of the module, but the module might be a bit malicious. Oh God, what? So I'm just gonna, no, this one. What is happening? Finally. So I have this module P, and this module uh, is a bit malicious, and it just overrides write host and get command, and those things I need to be able to grab this get avocado function that I ultimately want to mock. So if I just implement it naively here in my module M, and I call get command from module broken, let's see what happens. So it just says, nope, nope, you're out of luck, because I'm using those functions that the user overwritten. Maybe he's just currently just mocking them, or he's trying to do some, some weird stuff, but I must not rely on the commandlets. Uh, I must not rely on PowerShell to resolve the commands for me. I need to provide them by myself. And so that's what I do here in the fixed version. So here I want to do some logging on the screen so I can see what's happening. I want to be able to turn off the logging 
and I'm grabbing the function uh, object by using get command. And so how it's done in Pester is that we have this table that's called save commands. Uh, and inside of it, we are putting um, the command objects that we resolve when the module is imported. So there is a long list of commands, and we are doing just get command, write host, and then we specify this will be a commandlet, and it's coming from this module. So we are quite sure that we are getting the real command, not some mock. And then here I'm just grabbing the module and doing the same trick as before, just invoking it inside of the module. And because script blocks can, can take parameters, I can provide some parameters. So I have this param block to which I push this hash table, and then I'm just using it to safely invoke in the color scope, but invoke the references that I have back inside of Pester. So I can do this logging, and I can grab those commands. And I'm providing this as a hash table because this has much smaller footprint. In this case, it doesn't really matter because I'm creating a new scope. But uh, if the user had a parameters parameter or a variable and we overwritten it with this, then we wouldn't have access to everything. So we are trying to get uh, non-conflicting names and normally it would probably just say even pester in the middle and so on. So we can make sure this doesn't make any conflict. If you would be dot sourcing it, then you would remove the variable after yourself so there is no junk left. And so here inside of the hash table, I'm both passing the command name and module name, but also reference to the get command that I grabbed before. But I'm not limited to just that. So I can pass in also a script block. And as I said, script block is bound to the place that created it. So I'm injecting a script block that's bound to the module that created it, and I can use it, for example, to resolve this log, which is defined in here, and falls inside of this script block. And I don't have to pass it as a parameter. And I'm also sure that it, this variable will resolve to the one that I defined above. So I'm injecting a script block in a color scope, injecting a script block inside of it to have some behavior, and uh, I have to balance this to make sure that... Uh, I'm in a safe environment, do the safe actions, and in the end, it leads to this nice behavior where, for example, here I can just say false, and it will no longer log. Okay. Are we past the 25-minute mark? Two minutes. Okay, so last demo, which is on the same, in the same lane. So right now we were just trying to grab a function from, from, the, from the scope of some other module. But what if we define a mock? When we define a mock, we are defining a function that is in the caller scope. And so then the function doesn't have any way to call back inside of Pester module because the functions that, are, that it needs to invoke are internal to Pester. So we have this like invoke mock that is internal to Pester and we need to define a function that's outside of Pester, but we need to let this function to be able to call this function that's inside of Pester. But we don't want to publish it because it's not part of the public API. So one way to do it is to just publish it. That's how we did it in version four. Another way to do it is to find some place where we can share this. And a good place to share this is the function object itself. So when you define the function, and then you call get command on it, you get the function object, and you have easy time accessing it both from the place that uh, created the function and also from the function that is being called because there you can use my invocation, my command, and you resolve to the same place. So if you take this function object and you add, for example, a mock property on it, then you can resolve it both from Pester and both from the function and the data that you share you can share a reference back to the internal function. So that's what I'm outlining here. I have this definition of a mock, so this is what will run when the mock is defined. And then I'm uh, creating the function in a script scope so it's preserved. And I'm returning it back. So this returns an array of functions, so I'm just grabbing the first one because I only defined one. And so when this is invoked, it's first bound to the color scope, so we invoke it in the color scope, and uh, it defines the function and outputs it outside. So now I have a reference. Yeah, now I have a reference to the function, and now I can attach 
the property to it. So that's what I do here. And so then when it's finally invoked, I can go inside of the function, resolve the reference to the mock, invoke it, and that will invoke the internal function of Pester, and I don't have to publish it. This is a super, super difficult way to do it when I was researching it for the, for the conference. There's also a simpler way. You just create the script block, and then you take a script block that's bound to the mock scope, and you just define it outside. So you kind of dynamically define a function from a mock without exporting it in like the manifest. But this is what is in use right now. So let's just run it. So it works as a real mock. You have mock invoked. You are binding here to the session, session state, and you are also counting. It was counted once. So if you're interested in it, just look at this demo. So that's the first part about scoping. So session state is like a silo holding a separate state per module. Scopes hold variables, functions, and other stuff. Script blocks are bound to the session state that created them, and they stay bound even if you move them somewhere else. Uh, scopes are tracked independently in each session state, and script block parameters allow you to pass script blocks and commands references around, so from one session state to another, or and third, and so on. Now for the second part, the new things in Pester version 5. So the first feature is test discovery. And test discovery is something that I always missed in Pester. And what it enables us to do is to find structure of tests without actually executing them. So you can give Pester the file, it can go through it, and then it can tell you, those are the 20 tests that you have, they are in this structure, and if you apply this filter on it, then this is the one test that will run and not the others, and so on. So we can filter basically on any criteria, not just the name, right? Like right now in Pester version 4, we can have tags on describe, tags on it. Pretty much any aspect of the test can be filtered upon if I add the code. And so what this uh, enables in the end is that you can skip whole files if you just find that no tests in them will run. So if you have expensive setup on the start, like importing a big module, then you don't have to take this hit just to not run any tests afterwards. You just skip the whole file. Or if you have like a tree where you have set up on the start like a before all, and then you have no tests inside of that describe, then you just skip the whole describe and just don't run the setup. So that's super useful. You're saving a lot of time. But the thing is, how do you do this? So there are two ways. One of them is using AST, or abstract syntax tree, and there will be two, I hope, awesome talks on it. And the other one is execution. So when I was deciding this, I was looking at like what I need this to handle. And it needs to be able to handle stuff that's in separate files. It's generated by functions and loops, such as when you have DBHX or some other like OVF where you are generating pester tests from some other function, then you have to be handled, able to handle that. It has to be able to handle uh, tests with the same name, with expanded variables in their names, and so on. So doing this in AST would be borderline impossible, I think, because then you don't get the runtime value, so you like want to test for all the files you have in your folder, and how do you get that from AST without executing any code? So instead, what I do, is I do like a two-pass execution. So in the first pass that I call discovery, you just execute every describe and context, but for the it, you just don't execute the script block that you provide, you just save the info for later. And then you do pass on it, which will do the filtering, and then when you run it, you execute everything based on the metadata. So if you calculate it like this should run, then you execute it, and if it shouldn't run, then you don't. The downside is that all code must be in pester controlled blocks, otherwise we cannot control the execution, which sounds like a terrible thing, but it's kind of just this kind of change. So instead of dot sourcing directly or putting your setups outside of before all, just put them inside of before all and then it works. Well, yeah. Um, so this is how it works internally. We have this result array with a current block and is discovery. And then I have describe, which checks, am I in the discovery mode or not? And if it is, then it saves the metadata into the results and in the current block. 
and then executes the body. So we can go down into the like a tree of discover of describes, and then the function it if it's in the discovery mode, it just saves the metadata. So a test like this would give us some metadata that would look like this. So we have name, script block, tests, and so much more info. This is just very shortened to fit on the slide. And so we get this nice tree of what we have, but so far we didn't execute anything unless you've put code outside of pester control blocks. So the upside here is run only what is needed, so much better filtering, you can do focusing of tests, and you can also have better UI integration because the tool can first scan scan the file, look what tests are there, and then you can select from like a graphical thing instead of running everything and then seeing the result. Downside is that there is longer time before the first test execution, so that's the whole idea of a pipeline, that you push stuff in it and you get the first items out uh, sooner than if you would just do everything at the same time and then get the result at the end. It will still take the same time, but it seems faster to you because the first results came much faster than if you would do a bulk, and with this approach, that's a problem. And uh, there is also no interactive mode yet in Pesto version 5, so if you press F5, it will just throw an exception, but that will be fixed. So, some quick demo. I have this discovery file. So here I have the first file that I want to show you, if it opens. And it looks like this. I have two tests, I have some setups, and one of the tests has a tag. So if I just run it first without specifying any tags, both of the tests run. You can also look here, I'm not sure if you can see it, but it says starting test discovery in one files, found two tests, and then the execution starts. And if I filter it out on the exclude tag, then you could also see that the tag is on the it and not on the describe, and it's not even top level describe. So it's already better. And then you just run setup one and you don't run the setup two, so you filtered out that overhead if there was any. You can also filter out the whole file. So yeah, and as well, this works because we have this run result which looks like this. It's a lot of stuff, like very deep hierarchy of, that exactly describes what's in the file. And then it just looks here at the should run and it says, yes, this should run. Then it looks at the first block, which would be the describe, and it sees, yes, this should run as well. And then it looks at the next one and the post-processing saw, like, there are no tests in this block, so there is no point in running this. And so it said this should run to false, so they can out it can automatically skip it. The same idea here is with filtering a whole file. So here I have pretty expensive setup, which takes three seconds. And if I run this... Then it waits for three seconds and so on. And now if I filter the only test that was there, then in version five we would wait for three seconds and then we wouldn't execute anything. So instead of that, we see that this, this, this file doesn't include any test that will run and so just the whole file is skipped. Again, with this setting to should run to false. And last thing in this is a focusing of test. So this is how the file looks like. So I have um, this file, I have just two tests in it, but if I wanted to debug this, I would set a breakpoint here and say there is some non-trivial setup, so you don't want to run it interactively, you want to run it through the file. So now I will hit the breakpoint as many times as you know the number of the tests that target this function. So what I can do is that I could go here and maybe set a tag and then put like a tag to the invoke, or I can just use this focus parameter that can focus just this test, or it can focus the describe. So if I want to run just one test because I suspect there is a bug and I want to step through it, then I can do it this way. So let's see how it works. I'm just gonna remove the breakpoint. 
yeah, and it just run the single test, the other one was skipped. So it's only just a convenience thing, but it's super convenient when you have a file that has a lot of tests, like I have with tests for mock, for example, where I have 800 tests targeting the same function. Okay. Now test execution. Test execution is uh, pretty much the same as before. We just need to look up the metadata so we know what should be skipped, the setups need to be uh, invoked, but the main challenge is keeping the scoping correct. So for example, if you, run, if you use before each in PESTA version four, then it will be scoped above and outside of the describe, so you are actually importing the variables in your script scope. So if you have something that depends on value to be set to something and then you run the test, then you might end up with the value set in the script scope and just, it won't be a re repeatable run so keeping the scoping correct is super difficult. And so this is kind of how it looks like. We just find the metadata, check if it should run, write some metadata about the run, like when it executed, if it executed, then if it passed, and so on. And then there is this invoke script block, which is at the heart of the whole new pester, which gets a before each, gets a script block, that's the test, and gets a teardown. And it kind of looks like this. So I add another scope to make sure that this is isolated, and then I try to import before all. Then I add another scope, so if I have multiple tests running in succession, then they will be isolated from each other. And then in the same scope, I'm dot sourcing before each, dot sourcing test, and dot sourcing after each. So the variables defined inside of the test or inside of the before each can be overwritten. For example, I want to define like dollar file, create a file, and then in after each, I want to delete the file. So I want this file variable to be set to the value that was set inside of it block, which is not possible in version four unless you define it in the upper scope. And so this is the idea, but in reality, it looks more like this. So a lot of avoiding to overwriting other parameters. You have to be able to do multiple setups. So you have to be uh, careful about not overwriting the stuff if you are dot sourcing it and so on. So this is the real face of the of the runtime. <laughs> that's that's the only difficult part. But uh, if you look at it, you remove the underscores, you remove the for each's. It has totally the same structure as in this example. Then there's this result object, which is like a trunk running through the whole runtime. So in the previous version, there is just this test cases and it's kind of uh, aggregated and so on. But in the new version, everything is saved inside of the result object. So then you can like drill down inside it and just, and you get one for each file. So then if you have parallel run, then you just put them together as an array and then you post process them. So in this run result, I'm looking at the first run result, at the first block, first block, and then the test number three. And then I can get like a name, should uh, run, execute it, pass, the error record, and so on. A lot of stuff. So the motivation is to get like better hierarchy. So then when you write your code to process it, for example, to get a better dashboard or output that you want, then you can do it just by going through the object and to not do any assumptions about how you will use the data, but give you a lot of data. Let me just show you the object. Okay, so this one. So here I'm running it, I have some discovery and I have one failed test and so on. I also have some test cases, and then I have another describe with another test. So I can look at the run result, and here does, like does first index is implied because that's how PowerShell works, so this is just easy way to do it instead of writing like zero here. And so I can see that the whole file should run, so that's fine. It was executed, so I can also look at this should run but wasn't executed, what's happening there. I can look at the setup itself. I can look how many blocks were there, what's inside of the first block, what's its name. Then I can drill down to the test number three that failed, so I can see its name. 
I can see like the whole path to it. So like the describe D1, describe D11, and then the test I3. It should run, was executed, but it didn't pass. So here's the error record for it in the raw format. And here's how long it took to execute and so on. So it's a ton of raw data that you can use. Also, if I look at it, I can see that there is six tests inside of it, but here you can count just five. So zero to four is five. That's because these test cases generate a test of their own. So then I have the name of the first one. I have like a sequential ID that can be also provided from the outside. And I have the data associated with that test. And here is the same. So this is, uh, this is the output of the test right now. It needs some refinement and so on, and you are welcome to comment on it, but the idea is to give you much, much better overview of what's there, what's the hierarchy, what the data are there, and there is like so much stuff that you can have. It's also linked in a way that the block links to the test and the test links back to the block. So if you want all tests and you can just uh, get all tests that you found and then you can like uh, go from the test up to the blocks instead of the other way around, which is much easier way to look at the results if you want to do a summary. Good, we still have times. Um, so now a concept of plugins, that's also something that's really new. And uh, the plugins are maybe a bit Low, made more low level than you would expect. So write screen is import is done as a plugin. Mock is also done as a plugin. Test drive and test registry. Pretty much everything that's not the main execution of the code is wrote as a plugin. And the idea here is that I want to decouple the execution from the additional behavior that we want that I want to add on it. So I can do the scoping correctly in one place and then I can just shove the script blocks into it to be called. And it's much easier for me to reorganize what happens where. And I can also implement one concern in one place. So I can have this plugin for writing screen. It's one file. It has some endpoints. And then I just plug it into the runtime, and it works fine. So plugin is just a collection of script blocks, and they are called at appropriate time within appropriate scope. And they get this dollar context right now, a variable that is pointing to the current block and current test, so they know where they are. And multiple plugins can be registered to the same step. And the setups are also called in the way that are provided, but the teardowns are reversed. So when you do write screen, <coughs> test drive, mock, then you want to tear down mock, then test drive, then write screen. So it goes like that. So this is kind of how a mock looks like. It's just a PS object with, or in this case, a hash table, with uh, script blocks that you can provide to be run at appropriate time. And then this is how a mock actually looks like. So on each block setup start, don't click on it. On each block setup start, which is uh, on the start of before <coughs> each, I'm adding this context block plugin data mock, and inside of it, I add this hash table that's available to save the data. And the same thing is happening for the start or the setup of each test. And then when I do teardown, then I just remove the hooks, which are the functions that are defined to enable the mocking. And uh, the scope is, the state is also available for the other functions through like the current test and current block. So they can be resolved even when you call mock, for example, and then you want to resolve where you are and so on. So this thing is like a big trunk in the middle of the runtime, and everybody writes stuff into it. So that also enables you to preserve the stuff even after the session is ended. So right now, if you do mocking in version 4, it will create a mock, it will finish with the block, it will throw it away, and you get no history whatsoever of what happened. So then you have to try to replicate it locally. You have to try to get the same setup at as at your build servers or at bright hosts, and try to like do the same thing again and hope it fails again. Or you get like a, a trail, a metadata that are st so stored in the object, and you can look at what happened. So in this last demo, I have this plugin 
which is really quick. And I'm just running this test, which defines this function f, defines this mock in before all, defines this mock for the same function in it, but then it has parameter filter. And then I'm just invoking uh, the mock in a way that invokes this one, and then I invoke it in a way that invokes this mock, and then I'm just checking if it works. So the test passes, so I called it the correct amount of times, and then I can also call it an after all. And then when after the run I reach into the result object, I can still see all the data that were there. So the mock that was defined in block zero is this, the history of the call, it was called once, I can see that those are the functions that were defined to enable the mocking. This is the behavior that was provided, so that's what you gave it through the script block. And inside of the test, I have the same, same thing, so I can look at the mock that was defined there. I can see it was called two times. It defined no new hook because the hook already existed. And uh, the behavior looks like this, and it has a filter and so on. So with preserving this in the, in the later stages, we can also add logs, we can add uh, AST rewriting that I'm working on with seemingly science. So you can get info about why, why your filter didn't pass and so on. So putting all the stuff instead of throwing it away and putting it inside of the trunk and then you can preserve it afterwards will give you much better post-mortem of the test and uh, you can use it to debug your tests much, easy, much more easily. So in summary, knowing your scopes and session states can help you make PowerShell behave the way you want. It's especially useful when you're dealing with DSLs. Then there is a lot of new stuff coming in Pester v5. Come discuss it tomorrow during lunch. You can also try it yourself. There is alpha version 4, I think, uh, on PS Gallery. So you can just do install module Pester, allow pre-release, and force. And I also want to thank to all contributors and users of Pester. So that's it. Question time? Do we still have? How much? Oh, nice. So questions? Are there any? No? OK, in that case, thank you. Thank you for coming. Huh? Oh, yeah. Press the button if you like the session, please. <laughs> <laughs>